let's see who we can get. Hopefully 2100 is on deck. All right. So let's play an E4. Let's go for the quick kill here against Borba 01. And we're facing an Alakine. Very, very nice. We're going to go for absolute maximum here. Let's play the four pawns attack. D4. We've played the Alakine with black in the speed run. I don't remember us facing it with white. I think maybe we did once or twice. Boom. And after knight b6, the classical main line is e takes d6. And then black plays either cd or ed. I'm sure most people in the chat, you've, you've probably seen like an Alakine game or two and you've seen that, that how that goes. But why does a line which often flies under the radar, and in my opinion, it, it, it might even be the best way to fight for an advantage. It's also a very ambitious line. And if you don't know it well, white can get crushed in five moves because of how ambitious it is. That's the four pawns attack. That's the move f4, supporting the e5 pawn. You're literally going for central domination, but at the cost of development. So we fall behind in development, which means that we need to play very, very carefully not to, to make sure our center doesn't collapse. And this is the first instance where we have to be careful. The automatic move is knight f3, but it turns out that knight f3 is a very serious inaccuracy because of bishop g4. So, and the move c5 here would give up this massive outpost on d5. We don't want to create that gaping hole in the center. Uh, so instead, we want to find a different way to defend d4. And we do that with bishop e3. Generally, black develops the bishop to f5. And then we continue with knight c3. Now, now the threat is knight b4. So we need to develop our knight so that knight b4 can be met with rook c1. Queen d7, yeah, that is one of the legitimate lines. Now, at this point, we've developed several of our pieces. So it, it already makes sense to play knight f3. The move bishop g4 is no longer dangerous uh, because we've developed enough pieces to deal with to deal with that move. So it's time for us to complete our development. Knight f3, bishop e2 castles. Bishop g4 is played. Yeah, that's a legitimate move. And let me try to remember how we're supposed to counter it. Um, if I'm not mistaken, which I probably am, we are supposed to sacrifice a pawn here. Yeah, so there, there, there. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure we're supposed to sack a pawn here for development. Um, and play the move bishop e2. Bishop takes f3, bishop takes f3, and I think we're supposed to give up that pawn on c4, simply. And it turns out that our lead in development and our two bishops uh, offer more than enough compensation for it. But, but that could also be wrong. That could also be wrong. But we have to give it a shot. This is classic Naroditsky style. Bishop e2, bishop f3, bishop f3. Let him take it. Okay, he doesn't take it. He doesn't take it. Okay, now the situation again has changed. If we castle, then we allow bishop takes f3, bishop takes f3, knight takes d4. And this d4 pawn we do not want to lose because our center collapses if we lose that pawn. Um, the move d5 comes to mind. Maybe we should just push that pawn. But but then black plays bishop takes f3. And if we take back, then we lose the e pawn. That's also not a pawn we want to lose. It, it isn't, it's not entirely clear what to do. But that old move gain suggested, the move c5. It used to be the case that giving up the d5 square was not worth it. But, but now the black has castled queenside. The move c5 essentially jumps jump starts a queenside attack. So I believe that this is a theoretical move c5. We do give up the d5 square, but in return, this pawn clamps down on black's position, and our queen can later come out to a4 to start the attack. All right. So, no, I, I still kind of remember this. I think this is this is all correct. So we take it. And, all right, after queen takes d5, I believe, I think it did so. I believe that we can do several different things. We can probably just castle. Or we can play a move such as queen c2. Hmm. Yeah, I should have looked this up at some point because now I've, I've gotten dragged into theory that I don't, I don't know very well. Or we can play Artemia style. We can play king f2. Uh, lending reinforcement to our bishop and preparing queen a4. I actually quite like that move. I like the move king f2 here. 
just to make sure the bishop is nicely protected connecting our rooks and uh and then based on what he does we will see if we can move the queen out let's go king f2 or maybe get him out of his theory at least another idea is to go rook c1 followed by bishop c4 we can also push the b pawn try to create an attack that way lots of possibilities here for white lots of possibilities here for white hmm queen a4 is very very tempting but then perhaps black goes queen e4 this guy's good you know let's start with tickling him let's go h3 see what he does and based on that we're going to map out our further course of action the reason i want to go h3 is because if bishop h5 at, at convenience like when i when i went right i can play g4 and we want to have that move in our pocket anywhere but your pocket all right and then i want to play queen a4 bishop f5 a little bit unexpected i was expecting bishop h5 but okay we'll take it let's get this queen out onto the uh, onto the queen side and our ultimate goal here is to play b4 b5 get this knight off of c6 and crash through via a7 yeah maybe bishop e4 but i don't think that's dangerous queen e4 yeah i thought this move was more dangerous with the bishop on h5 now it threatens bishop takes c5 that is the immediate threat why is that a threat because we cannot take our queen will be hanging um there is a problem with b4 in that he can play maybe knight takes d4 and try to sack the knight uh, or the exchange to open our king but i don't think that's a big issue let's go b4 i don't believe knight takes d4 is a big issue here very sharp position we're trying to insist on our plan here we're trying to go b5 and um i think that maybe there was a stronger move that went a lot of material yeah I kind of missed an idea that instead would have, I think, yielded a, a huge position. Well, I don't really understand it either. It's it's sharp. Yeah, we missed the opportunity train on that one. But this queen is in big trouble. You know, so the first thing I see when I look at this position, this queen doesn't have a lot of squares. So trading queens and playing b5, that would probably be okay. But I feel like we could play for maximum by keeping the queens on the board. Now, can we even keep the queens on the board if we wanted to? The answer is yes. Can we keep the queen? How can we keep the queens on the board? We can play queen a3. Now, bishop b5 is the bishop is pinned, plus he can still take our queen. All right. What exactly are we threatening here? Well, rook c1 is a possibility forcing the queen back to e4. But we might want to hold off on that move. We might want to try to get the e4 square under control. And then rook ac1 would trap the queen, so... There's a lot of possibilities in a position like this. All right. How can we get the e4 square under control? Well, we have a move like knight g5 in certain cases. All right. He goes back to he goes bishop e7. How does that deal with b5, though? I don't get it. Because if we play b5 and the knight has to drop back to b8, well, we're very happy to see that. b5, knight takes d4 four maybe he wants takes bishop c5 oh no, no no b5 knight d4 we just take i think okay let's go b5 i don't really understand that move and if knight b8 then i think we can just grab that pawn on a7 because why not why can't we just grab that pawn yeah he definitely missed this move There's no doubt that black subs black sword thank you okay might be it well, give me that pawn, please. Bishop d3. I saw that move. It's not as big of an issue as it appears, I think, because we can simply defend our bishop on d3. And we can do that by playing rook h to e1. 
Okay. Now, this is tremendously complex, and at this level, these kinds of kinds of games just kind of happen. And I mean, you just gotta roll with it, and and you gotta gotta try to make the most out of the chaos. Thank you for the tier two. Now, we've got several good moves here, I think. Um, you could try to get rid of this queen, but amazingly, he's found a, a great resource. If rook a c one, then queen a four, and the queen simultaneously defends the bishop and, and offers a queen trade. So better idea probably is to go rook a b1. Better, oh, oh, but then he takes and we take. Okay, the rook a b1 is probably a better idea. We'll have to speed up a little bit. All right. Bishop c6, we'll play rook e c1. And try to get rid of the queen. Queen a4 anyway, wow. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, we have to take. I missed this move. This end game is not worse for us, I guess, but now we have to go into an end game. Let's go knight d2. Let's try to get this knight around to c4 and a5. Okay. I definitely would rather have white here because this pawn on b7 is a long-term weakness. B file is open. And if we can get our knight to a5, then we're in pretty decent shape. Let's go knight c4. Why not? If he takes on e5, we take back with a knight. So we simultaneously prepare to swing the knight to a5 and defend the pawn on e5. Definitely I didn't play this right. I, I, I'm sure I, I think I saw the winning move. And I only saw it after we made a different move, so. It's part of it. You gotta adapt to the new set of circumstances. Bishop c6. Okay, knight a5 is no longer effective because we give up the e5 pawn. We don't want our center to collapse. We do not want our center to collapse here. So one option is to target this bishop and offer a bishop trade. Why is offering a bishop trade potentially good for us? Because, well, because then the b7 pawn is going to be left without a defender. Okay, takes. We take with the knight. Now, I think that might have been a mistake. The e6 pawn is quite, quite weak. Rook a hf8. All right. Well, I kind of want to get out of this pin. Let's go king g3. Let's get out of the pin. Yeah, very strong player. So we're going to have to speed up. We're going to take with the knight to not ruin the integrity of our pawn structure. I don't want to play gf and get isolated pawns, even if it means dropping the knight from the outpost. One positive byproduct of this is the rook is extraing the e6 pawn. So let's drop our bishop back here and try to mount the pressure on that pawn. And as a follow-up, we could try to double rooks on the e-file and keep targeting it. Yeah, this is very this is about equal, I think. This is not if it's better for, for me, then it's only a tiny advantage. So it's gonna be a it's gonna be a grind here winning this with two minutes. Yeah, so far I have not lost a game in the 10 minute speedrun, I think. Okay, we're gonna double rooks. And this king on g3 is a little bit in the way. So let's move it back to h2 in order to be able to move this bishop along the diagonal. We could also play bishop g3 and reposition the bishop on a slightly more active square. On f2, it's not really doing anything. We don't need another pair of eyes on the d4 pawn. Our knight and the rook are per perfectly doing the job. No, it doesn't hang d4. We have two defenders on it. Bishop g3. Probably going to go g5 is this guy. Okay, let's go bishop b5, offer up a trade, and try to get this rook off of f6. Okay, he goes for it. Now we get a very nice knight on e5. Plus, the king has to move from d7, which, which would mean that the e6 pawn becomes a lot weaker. Can we ex how can we exploit the weakness of the e6 pawn in this position? Or how can we try? We can go knight back to g4, attack the rook, and prepare to capture on e6. Now things get a little bit iffy for black. But if he goes rook g6, then it complicates the scenario. Because if we take on e6, then black takes, and he takes on d4. And I'm not convinced that that position is so clear. So I'm thinking we should play a little bit more patiently. 
Uh, what does that mean? Well, Musich's rook f1 could be nice here, occupying the open file, which was vacated by Black's rook, continuing to poke in pride and eventually try to find ways to make inroads into Black's position, such as rook f7. That's how you play these end games. Okay, knight at 95, he's got rook f6, which I don't want to allow, so let's drop it back to e3 with tempo. After rook d7, we cannot play rook f7 due to bishop d6 check. What we can do, perhaps, is reposition the rook back to b1 and go for that old plan of attacking the b7 pawn. Trying to eventually overextend him. Okay, knight c4 makes sense. Yeah, let's go knight c4, try to go to e5. If bishop f6, then we get we take e5. Uh, we take e6, I think. g4. And finally, a blunder. Blood is the fourth. Eventually, we put pressure, 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 and oftentimes, if, if you do it well enough, a blunder does come. Um, we got lucky here, but oftentimes, these kinds of blunders are the result of are, are the result of this kind of pressure that we put on our opponent. All right. Nice Magnus Carlson TV. Well, I think he missed the fork because he thought we wanted to go knight a5. One source of blunders that people almost never talk about is you're like, well, how did he blunder this obvious move? Well, to you, it was obvious why you played your last move, but your opponent might have misinterpreted the reason behind your last move. He might, he might have thought the knight comes to a5 and you might have been convinced of that. All right, so we can grab another pawn, but I don't really want to allow the rook to get active. So what I'm going to do instead is rook f1, offer the rook trade, force the rook off of the f-file. And then infiltrate via the f-file to f7 or f3 or whatever. Let's go rook f7, seventh rank. Perhaps we could drop it to h7 and go after the h-pawn. Yes. This guy does not go gentle into that good knight. Okay, now I don't want the rook to come to f6 and then f2. That's a scenario we want to avoid, which is why I'm going to go rook f4. Let's delegate, give the other rook an assignment here, and potentially piggies on the 7th, which is the ideal placement of rooks on the 7th rank in the endgame. We can go for it, even though he's got bishop e3. Bishop takes d4. We could give up that pawn because we have rooks on the seventh rank. If we want to be, if we want to play like a Russian schoolboy, you want to eliminate all sorts of counterplay. But if he goes bishop f6, we might have to. We might have to give that pawn up and suck it up. Yeah, we're going to have to suck it up and, and go rook f7. Which is totally winning because this is just one pawn. We take on c7. We take on c7 and we threaten checkmate on c8. He's got a couple of checks. But not more than that. Okay, rook f6. Generally, in such endgames, you want to you want to get the king as as far into the center as possible. You don't want the king stumbling around uh, and getting into a mating net. So we just go king e2. Yeah, king e1 would be worse. I I'm trying to get the king to the center so that we don't have to worry about random mating nets. And okay, rook c8 is made. Tough game, and we're over 2100, less than 100 points away from the conclusion. Very, very nice game, even though there were a lot of mistakes. I'm not going to pretend that I played well. I think closer to the start of the game, I missed an opportunity to put him away. So let me talk about where this opportunity was. I think here there was a hidden way after queen a4, queen e4. For some reason, I completely missed a relatively obvious move. And I don't know why I missed it. It's weird. Um, I'm not sure why I missed this move. Let me, let me just show you. I, I'm going to have to run right after I show you this one moment because I don't want to miss Uber. Yep. So after queen e4, we simply have knight g5. I, I saw the, the presence of this move, but I thought black had a check. And I simply didn't calculate far enough. After g3, black is busted. He's got to move his queen. We take the pawn. We win a lot of material. And after queen back to d5, we, you know, we can take on f7, but even better is to play something like bishop f3. And then pawn up to b4, and the attack is totally unstoppable here against Black's king. So 
This was relatively straightforward. I don't know why I didn't do it, but uh, the fact remains.